So we're going to use the example of the Congo Free State to look at European economic policies as they colonized Africa, and also the methods that King Leopold II used to mobilize public support for his imperial mission. So in 1876, King Leopold II of Belgium founded the International African Association. And he created this association at a Brussels Geographic Conference. So he purposefully invited philanthropists, geographers, humanitarians to this conference. And he claimed that he wanted to quote unquote discover and quote unquote civilize the Congo. So he alleged that really his civilizing mission was going in to stamp out slavery. He talked about Arab slave traders who were taking Africans to the east and then selling them either to plantations along East Africa or else in the larger Indian Ocean basin. However, I think you'll see that King Leopold II's intentions were not as humanitarian as he actually claimed. What he ends up doing is sending in explorers, including Stanley, to set up those flags, and they would quote unquote, negotiate treaties with African chiefs, either using real or implied force. They would go with soldiers with guns. And um, once he had those treaties, his agents would go about economically exploiting these areas. And King Leopold II is different than other European monarchs at the time because he actually set up the Congo Free State as his own personal property. This was like his backyard. It was his entirely. Even though he used this International African Association to make it seem like it belonged to, you know, a corporate body or a larger humanitarian organization, this was his. So historians estimate that 5 to 10 million people died while the Congo Free State was under King Leopold II's control. Um, they died from starvation, enslavement, some of them were worked to death, there was horrible destruction of the environment. So we're going to talk about this exploitation and the economics of this colony for King Leopold. So the first thing that King Leopold was having his agents export for his economic benefit was ivory. And ivory was a sought after luxury good in Europe and he was able to sell it successfully for a couple of years, but it wasn't making him the kind of profits that he wanted. Actually, he was losing money on the export of ivory. But there's a coincidence in that we start getting a demand for rubber, primarily for bicycle tires in the 1870s. And the Congo Free State had wild supplies of rubber and it took about a decade or maybe a little more to establish rubber plantations where you could grow and cultivate rubber. So these sources of wild rubber were really important in a rubber boom in the 1870s and the 1880s. And the Congo had it. So Leopold's agents would force African soldiers known as the force public, a lot of them were conscripted, to get African men to meet quotas for rubber collection. And these members of the force public, who were often kidnapped themselves, were forced to hold men and women, wives and children of these African men hostage while the men met their rubber quotas. And this period of time is really associated with great brutality, rape, mutilation, the use of whips. Um, they would also burn villages that didn't meet their rubber quotas. So there were great atrocities associated with this rubber collection. The rubber collection was really dangerous. So these men actually had to climb up sometimes hundreds of feet into trees and collect the rubber. You uh, slit the rubber vines and then you wait at the bottom. You'll see the pots collected down there below in the picture for the rubber to slowly drain out. But the quotas got higher and higher that these for men were forced to make. And at the same time, they were having to go farther and farther away from their homes in order to meet their quotas. So they were exposed to all sorts of dangerous conditions. Not only could they fall from trees, but they were trying to support themselves hundreds of miles sometimes away from their homes. They were in jungles. They had no protection. And the working conditions were such that if they didn't meet their quota, they'd be beaten, whipped, or even they were supposed to be killed if they didn't meet their quota. Uh, one of the things that sticks in my mind too about this is just what the men did to dry the rubber. So rubber comes out almost like a rubber cement. It's fairly tacky 
and sticky and you have to dry it in order to go and have it weighed. The men had to dry it and roll it into balls. Um, and in order to dry it in a jungle situation or a situation where they're fairly mobile and being forced to move place to place, they would actually spread it on their arms or on their chest, wait for it to dry, and then peel it off. So when they peeled it off, layers of their skin would come off as well. This rubber collection also led to great deforestation because the men sometimes got desperate and instead of just tapping the rubber vine, which it would survive, um, they would cut it off entirely um, and it led to deforestation. So the force publique, these African soldiers who were forced to meet these quotas, used brutal tactics to collect the rubber. What they were supposed to do is shoot any man who didn't meet his rubber quota. And in order to show that they were using their ammunition to shoot rebels or uh, people who refused to meet quotas, they were supposed to cut off the hand of the person, or sometimes castrate um, the man that refused to meet the quota. Uh, that's what they were supposed to do. And they were supposed to do this to show that you know, they weren't stockpiling bullets to lead a rebellion against the Belgian agents. But some members of the force publique used their ammunition for other reasons, you know, hunting, or maybe they did try and stockpile some of it. So you had this terrorizing campaign where they would actually just cut the hands off of anybody they encountered so that they could try to account for their use of bullets. And we had missionaries and journalists in the late 1800s and the early 1900s who saw evidence of women and children being mutilated in this way, and they led a very public human rights campaign to try and get the Belgian Free State taken out of the hands of King Leopold II. And actually, when news of this first came out, King Leopold scoffed at it, and he said these were ridiculous allegations. And he actually won a libel suit in 1902 against some of the journalists and humanitarians who had uh, alleged that he was doing this. But over time, it's very clearly exposed. I mean, you see the pictures here on the slide. Uh, this kind of uh, propaganda negative press exposed the exploitative relationship and how King Leopold II had said he was going in to stop the slave trade but was in fact enslaving people. I mean, he had his Belgian agents and his force probably take men away in chains. And this was exposed so that there was a general public outcry and uh, King Leopold II was forced to give up the Belgian Free State. So the Belgian Free State was turned into a Belgian property controlled by the Belgian Parliament, the Belgian Congo. But don't feel too sorry for King Leopold II, I don't know how you could, but he worked out a nice deal so that he got 50 million francs and he had started to actually run the Congo Free State into debt because we were getting out of this period of the rubber boom, so he also just passed on the Congo Free State's debt to the Belgian state. And in general, then, the Belgian Congo follows the trend that other colonial possessions did. We had general European quests to control the natural resources for their own benefit by exporting them, uh, often cash crops or mineral resources, to Europe. And then they developed infrastructure in order to facilitate this export and not for the benefit of Africans. We also had new systems of taxation, like the head tax that you saw with the Maji Maji Rebellion, that the cost of administering these colonies was supposed to be passed on to African people. It wasn't supposed to be paid by through European taxation. So we have a move towards cash crops, we've got a move towards capitalism, and we've got certain trends in infrastructure that were focused on building this export economy.